Um, the Latin definition of theology is the study of God. I happen to prefer uh, to go back a little bit further to the Greek definition. Uh, in Greek, it's theos logos. It's, it's uh, theos, God, and it's logos, the word, or the thought, or the matter, the subject. Uh, it's the idea that when you talk about God, he's the subject of what you're talking about. It is to have thoughts or words about God. And as such, that means everybody who has thoughts or words about God is doing theology. Or he is a theologian. Theology is not relegated to those who are in the ivory tower. Everybody who says something about God, has thoughts about God, is doing theology. He is a theologian as such. The question then becomes, is he a good one or not? Does he have good theology? Today I want to talk to you about theology. I want to talk to you about uh, good theology. Before we move from the era of the patriarchs in um, the Old Testament, I want to talk to you from a uh, very unique book in the Old Testament, but the character is centered in the time of the patriarchs, and that's, and that's the character Job from the book of Job. Job undoubtedly lived during the era of the patriarchs, and so we're going to learn something before we leave that era of the patriarchs and move into the era of the kings. I wanted us to take a little stop by and hear from Job today. Now, I want to tell you right off the bat, this is really about theology. Um, I want to give you sort of an outline of the book. I want you to see uh, what the meaning that comes out of the book is. Uh, Job is actually 42 chapters long and we're going we're gonna to preach from all 42 chapters uh, today. And I made some of y'all really, really nervous, right? Um, but we, we're not going to be here that long. It doesn't take us that much to get its meaning. All right? So I want to begin at Job chapter 1. And uh, I just want to show you a brief outline of the book before we go back and look for its meaning. You, you know, you have to take it in its context. You, there's no one part of the book of Job you can read and get its meaning. I promise you, if you open the book of Job to the middle, right around chapter 20 or so, 20, uh, 21 or so, you're going to miss the meaning. Because the meaning is inescapable from chapter, chapter 1 and chapter 2. Right? You're going to get a great lesson today also in context. So here is the book in, his, in a nutshell. Uh, chapter 1 beginning at verse 1 through 5 just gives us a character assessment from the writer of the book of Job. Now you, you have to keep in mind, um, biblical characters are not always right. In other words, sometimes the writer can quote what someone else has said and not always what the character says is true. But what the writer says of scripture is always right. That, does that make sense to you? That, that's important for you to know. Just because David says something doesn't make David right unless David is the writer. You're going to hear a lot of things said in the book of Job. But not everything that's said is right. But in, chapters, in chapter 1, verse 1 through 5, what you're listening to is the writer of the book of Job, and he is, according to Scripture, infallible. All right? What he has to say to us is true. And you're going to hear what the writer says about Job, the character in the story, in verse 1 through 5. And then you're going to get a, a unique privilege beginning at chapter 1, verse 6, you're going to get the unique privilege to actually hear a conversation that goes on in heaven. Now, you, you need to understand, most folks don't get to hear this kind of conversation. It is, it is, it is relegated to just a very few in history. All right? You're going to get to hear it because the writer is going to share with you what God is actually saying in heaven. It's going to be an interesting conversation going on. And then something is going to begin to happen to Job. And what happens to Job is going to cover from chapter 3. Follow me here. It's going to cover from chapter 3 all the way to chapter 38. From chapter 3 to 38, 
you're going to get Job having a casual conversation in his home about what's going on in his life with his three friends, uh, Elphaz, uh, Zophar, and I can't remember the other guy's name, but we're going to get to it in just a minute. Three friends and Job in Job's living room, if you will, just having a conversation about God. And then beginning at chapter 38, then God is going to speak to Job and his friends about what he's really doing that they, are ha they will have had a whole conversation about that they're not right about. Everybody's got it? what's, what's going to happen. So here's, here is the writer's assessment of Job. You need to hear it because the things that you are going to hear about Job are going to contradict what the writer is going to tell you about Job. Listen to what the writer says about Job. I'm in chapter 1. He says, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was, listen to him, blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. Y'all are going to have to remember that given what you're going to hear because it's going to conflict with a whole lot of things you're going to hear and a whole lot of things that you used to believe. He is blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. And it also says he had seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys and very many servants and the man was greatest of all the men of the east now y'all need to understand this is written in the era of the patriarchs that's a long time ago listen if you have 7,000 sheep 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen today you're wealthy y'all need to get this and if you've got that much back in that era of the patriarchs you are ungodly wealthy if there is such a thing you have immense wealth and therefore he is one of the greatest men of the east everybody knows Job, and, and listen to him he goes on with a character uh, assessment of Job. his sons used to go to go and hold a feast in the house of each one of his day and they would sin and invite their sisters and they would eat and drink with them now you know as a father if you hear your children are eating and drinking and having parties regularly you're concerned and so was Job. So it says, and when the days of the feasting had completed their cycle, Job would sin and he would consecrate his children. Rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And thus Job did continually. He's a good father. He's praying regularly for his children that maybe or perhaps they may have sinned. So he is a good father, and he is taking care of all of his children. Now, the writer has given you a picture of Job. He is wealthy. He is a good father because he prays for his children. And according to the writer, he is blameless, upright, fearing God, and he's turning away from evil. Now, as a reader, particularly a Jewish reader, if you have heard that, then what you hear is that Job has all of that because God has blessed him, and God only blesses those who do right. All right, are y'all with me? That, that's also what most people think about God. That's most people's theology today. If you're doing well, then God will bless you. If you are not doing well, then God will not bless you. Now, watch what happens. Now, um, he, here is where the writer throws back the curtain on heaven and allows you to, to listen in. Verse number six. This is also going to be important. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. This is undoubtedly in heaven. And Satan also came among them. That's one of the few times you will have heard the name Satan up to this point in Scripture. He's only mentioned once before that in the, uh, in the book of Samuel. And he is alluded to in Genesis as the serpent. He's not often referred to in Scripture. By the way, you know, you know how some folks at church see Satan in everything? He's not even that much in the Bible. Not that he's not real. But God just doesn't spend much time talking about him, even in the Bible. All right? As a word to us in the good theology, we need to stop talking about Satan so much. But in this case, he tells us that Satan came 
with the sons of God, the passage says, and to present themselves before the Lord. Y- y'all stay with me. This is, he's going somewhere. It's going to be a good one. The Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. Now that's, very, that's a very elusive sort of an answer. The Lord said, where are you coming from? He said, I've just been walking around on the earth, just roaming around. Now, you know, we, we live on this side of further revelation, right? Now, the, the, the book of 1 Peter tells us that when the devil roams around, he's doing what? He's seeking someone to devour. Right now, he doesn't share that part with the Lord, but the Lord knows it anyway. And if you don't know it, then the Lord's words after that sound a little odd because the Lord says, well, have you considered my servant Job? Now, y'all got to follow. Consider him for what? Because the Lord knows he's looking for someone to devour. And then the Lord says, well, have you considered Job? If you want somebody to devour, how about Job? Now, the first thing y'all ought to think is that that's messing with my theology a little bit. Now, if I'm blameless and upright and fearing God, then why is God offering me up to Satan to be devoured? That's your first thought. Well, I, I think the Lord is getting at something. He, it, this is not just for Satan. This is also for the reader, which is us. But it is also for the rest of the host of heaven. W- watch what happens. He says in verse 8, then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth. Now this is, this is God's own assessment of Job. Listen to what he says. There's no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Now, th- th- this is where it gets interesting. This is where a, a good theology becomes important. I want you all to pay really close attention. Satan is going to do this twice. He's going to come before the Lord twice, and on both occasions, he is going to make a very emphatic statement about what he thinks about God. And I want you to notice just how close modern thinking is to the way Satan thinks about God. I I want you, you're going to hear from Satan's own lips, his own bad theology, And it's going to sound strikingly familiar to most church folks' theology. Listen to what he says. Uh, So verse 9, then Satan answered the Lord and he says, does Job fear God for nothing? Interesting statement, right? He says, surely there's a reason why he fears you, right? And then he says, have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. He said, surely that's the reason he fears you, right? And then he said, but if you put forth your hand now and you touch all that he has, he will surely curse you to your face. Here's what he just said. He said, the reason why Job fears you That's the word he used. Or he reveres you, or he responds to you in that upright manner. The reason why he turns away from evil is because you have done so much for him. You've given him so much stuff. You've blessed him. You've kept his stuff from being devoured. You've made him rich. He's wealthy. And anybody who's wealthy will fear you. They'll have reverence for you. And and now watch this. Then the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. Y'all see what just happened? There There was a wager in heaven between God and Satan. Satan says, You're not worth all that to Job. He just likes your stuff. And God says, Oh, really? then do with his stuff what you will, Mr. Devourer. Now, I don't know if, you, you know, you're reading this thing sort of casually, but, but if you're Job, that's not necessarily good news. And get this, and the reason Job is chosen, because God believes in him. 
God has sort of an innate understanding that Job knows him in a way that will cause him to be able to withstand having all of his stuff devoured by the devourer. But, but watch what happens. The story is still is just getting started. Now on that day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, right? It, it starts by telling you that all of the Job's sons are together and they're eating and drinking. But it's going to move from that and it's going to finish this section with, uh, with his sons. But watch what happens. And listen closely to the way the writer tells you the story. He says, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them and the Sabaeans attacked and took them. They also slew the servants with the edge of the sword and he says, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Only one has survived. And then it says, and the writer, you're going to hear this again and again, and while he was still speaking, he hadn't finished giving him the bad news when someone else comes in with more bad news. It says, while he was still speaking, I'm at verse 16, another came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and he burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Verse 17 says, and while he was still speaking, another came and he said, the Chaldeans formed three bands and made a raid on the camels and took them and they slew the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. This is all in one day. This is happening in an instant. And it says, and while he was still speaking, verse 18, another came and said, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came from, the, came from across the wilderness and it struck the four corners of the house and it fell on the young people and they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. So here's what the writer is creating for you. He's creating a picture of Job's devastation that says there's no way Job can think this has happened by happenstance. It's happened too fast, too sudden, and it's too all-consuming. Something spiritually has happened. Something has happened that would point all of these circumstances necessarily then back to God. Because nobody is that unfortunate. Y'all with me? No, nobody has so many bad things happen all at one time. You might think it all goes bad or sudden, but not like this. So he has lost his wealth and his children all in an instant. And look at what the passage says. Then Job arose and he tore his robe and he shaved his head and he fell to the ground and he did what? He worshipped. Y'all see that? He worshipped. Job is an uncommon fellow because I'm not sure worship would be on my mind at the time. But he worshiped. And here's what he said. Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Who won the wager? The Lord won the wager, didn't he? So, you know, when you're, when you're betting, if you lose one hand, then you just up the stakes, right? So wa watch what happens. Uh, and the writer tells you, through all of this, he did not sin, nor did he blame God. Yeah, yeah, this, it's a lot, but y'all need to stay with me because y'all going to get a great lesson in theology when this is over. Watch this. Um, verse chap I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Again, it's about to happen. And Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to him the same thing. Where are you coming from? Where you been? And then he says to him again, from roaming about on the earth and walking around on it, he's looking for someone to devour. And so the Lord says again, have you considered my servant Job? For there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man fearing God. And it's as if Satan has, has neglected to say, you know, Job is still all right. But the Lord says he's turning away from evil. And then the Lord says, and by the way, he still upholds, he still holds fast to his integrity. Although you incited me against him, listen to the words, this is going to become important, to ruin him without a cause. Y'all see the words? God says, you incited me to ruin the man without a cause. Now, what is really the, what is the spiritual cause of his ruin? Is Satan questioning whether or not God is worthy? But listen. There is no earthly cause for the ruin. Y'all following me? 
There is no earthly cause. He hasn't done anything to deserve the cause, the ruin. But now, I remember I told you, Satan has two ways of thinking. One is, they don't like you that much, they just like your stuff. Watch the second thing he says. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. That's interesting, isn't it? He says, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. He values his life above yours. Y'all see it? However, put forth your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. He tells the Lord, uh, you, you just kept him healthy. You took his stuff, but if you touch his body, he will curse you to your face. Because men value their lives more than your life, God. You, 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 put, you, put, you put some sickness on them, and they're going to question you. See, uh, Satan's way of thinking is, they will worship you as long as you give them good health. As long as you're healing them. As long as you're providing healing for them. They expect you to give them healing. And if you don't, they will curse you to your face. If they have that healing and miracle service and you don't heal anybody, folks won't come back to church next week. Because what they're really after is not you, God. They're after good health. Sound familiar? You, you know, I've always wondered, you know, the... The, the so-called uh, healing preachers, I've, I've never wondered why the folks hadn't wised up and realized that death is still bad in a thousand. Y'all get, get what I'm saying? Listen, I don't care how, how, how much faith you have, there's nobody yet who has been so healed that they've lived forever. They all end up dying of something. At, at some point, they don't get healed. But yet they'll still tell you, God wants you to be healed. God wants you to be healthy. And I can lay my hands on you and heal you of your diseases that always come back. Death is still batting a thousand. Even the Lord Jesus died. <laughs> Watch this. Then Satan went out, um, then uh, verse 5, however, put forth your hand now and touch his bones and his flesh and he will curse you to your face. So the Lord said to Satan, behold, he is in your power, only spare his life. You can do whatever you want to his body, just don't take his life. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and it smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a pot here to scrape himself while he was sitting amongst the ashes. And now he is, his health has failed. Watch this. And then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast your integrity? She gets in on the game. Curse God and die, she said. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not adversity? That's good theology. That's good way of thinking about God. In all this, Job did not what? With his lips. Now, that's going to become important. Did y'all hear what the writer told you? Did Job sin in all of this? Huh? He does. He says, in all of this, Job did not sin with what he said. Did y'all see it? Because here's what's important is all you're going to get from, from this moment on, from chapter 3 on, is the things that Job has to say about what's happening to him. Does he sin in anything he says? No. Come on, y'all read it right there in front of you. Does he sin with anything he says? He doesn't. The writer is always right. The writer says in all of this he did not sin in what he says. Y'all need to hear that because it's going to sound different to you. That's why, you know, if you were to go to the end of the book, it sounds like Job is sinning with what he says. But what does the writer tell you before you get into all that he says? He does not sin. He does not sin. Uh, it, that's, that part is important. Now, we, we're about to shift to what is the bulk of the book. Now, now don't lose this. What you just saw simply sets up what is the bulk of the book? The bulk of the book goes from chapter 3 to 38. Listen, 
The message then is not just in chapter 1 and 2, although it is vital to the message. The message is in what the people are going to say from 3 to 38. All right, y'all ready to hear some of it? Watch what happens. Now, Job, now when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity uh, they, that had come upon him, they came each one from his own place. There is Elphaz, the Timnite, as the one I couldn't remember, Bildad, the, the Shuite, and Zophar, the, the Namathite. And they made an appointment together to come to sympathize with him and to comfort him. When they lifted up their eyes at a distance and did not recognize him, they raised their voices and wept. And each one of them tore his robe, and they threw dust over their heads towards the sky. Then they sat down on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights, with no one speaking a word to him, for they saw that, he was, that his pain was very great. Now the writer is going to tell you this to give you the understanding that these are not fly-by-night friends of Job. These are good friends. Right? Listen, they, they made an appointment to get together to go comfort their friend. They came from a distance. They don't even live in us. They live somewhere else. But when they heard, they traveled together to bring him comfort. And when they saw him, they had an emotional reaction to what they saw that their friend looked like. And so then they sat down quietly for seven days and seven nights just to be with him. These are good friends. You know, I, you know, you got some friends who will say, you know, when you're going through your trouble, you know, if you need anything, call me. But they don't never come by. You know, those, those are friends who say, if, you know, if you need anything, you call me. Right? But they're not going to come and sit with you and just be your friend. These are good friends. And the writer is trying to get you to see that they are good friends. They really care about Joe. They're not trying to trick him. They care about it. Now, now here is where, though, the important parts of the book come. And here's why the book is going to unfold. Um, Job is going to lament his condition beginning at chapter 3. And then after he laments his condition, his friends are going to have something to say about the condition that he's in. And, and they're going to say, well, this is the reason why you're in the condition that you're in. Now, watch this. The rest of the book is that interchange. Job is going to say, oh, woe is me. And his friends are going to say, well, uh, this is the reason why you're in the shape you're in. And, and let, let, me, let me just show y'all really quickly. Beginning at chapter 3, I'm going to go fast. Chapter 3, Job laments his condition. Chapter 4, Elphaz responds to Job. Right? Then in chapter 6, Job responds to Elphaz. And then in chapter 8, Bildad responds to Job's response to Elphaz. And then in chapter 9, Job responds to Bildad. And then in chapter 11, Zophar is going to respond to Job's response to Bildad. And Job is going to respond to Zophar in chapter 12 and 13 and 14. And then Elphaz is going to respond to what Job says in chapter 15. And then Job is going to respond to Elphaz in chapter 16. And then Bilphaz is going to respond to Job in chapter 18. And then Job is going to respond to Bildad in chapter 19. And then in chapter 20, Zophar is going to respond to Job. And then in chapter 21, Job is going to respond to Zophar. And then in chapter 21, Elphaz is going to respond to Job. And listen, the rest of the book to chapter 38 goes that way. That's all you get. It's three friends discussing Job's situation, and they're using their theology. They're using their thoughts about God. Now, I need y'all to back up just a little bit because uh, the, the message is in what they say about God. I, I want y'all to listen just a little while. And, and you know what you're going to hear, what, some of the things that you're going to hear in here has made me so jaded when it comes to church folk and what they say about God. And here's why. Because so much of what you're about to hear from Job's friends, you have heard from your own church friends. Listen to what happens. Afterward, Job opened his mouth and he cursed the day of his birth. That's verse 1, chapter 3. And Job said, let the day perish on which I was born and the night which, uh, which said a boy is conceived. Y'all see what Job is doing? He's saying, curse the day I was born. All right? He's lamenting his condition. 
right? And he goes, he's going to go on the rest of chapter 3 lamenting his condition. Uh, in chapter 4, then, is Bildad's, I mean, Elphaz's turn to talk to Job about his lamenting his condition. Look, look at chapter 4, verse number 1. Then Elphaz the Timnite answered, If one ventures a word with you, will you become impatient? But who can refrain from speaking? Y'all heard it? You hear what he said? He said, you know, uh, if, I, if I were to say something to you, will you become impatient? But you know, I just can't help but to say this. You ever been in church when people just have to tell you something? You know, I, I wouldn't say this normally, but I just feel I'm led by the Lord to tell you this. I just have to say it. Watch what happens. Behold, you have admonished many. You have strengthened the weak, uh, strengthened weak hands, and your words have helped the tottering to stand, and you have strengthened feeble knees. But now it has come to you, and you are impatient. <laughs> uh, drop, drop down to verse number 7. He says, Remember now, whoever perishes being innocent, or where is the upright destroyed? According to what I have seen. <laughs> he says, according to what I have seen, those who plow iniquity and those who sow trouble harvest it. Y'all see what he just told him? What did he just tell Job? He said, you know, the reason you're in this condition is you did something. Because, you, you know, folks will always misquote scripture and say, and say to you, you know, only what you sow is what you're going to reap. But by the way, y'all know, um, uh, because you are in Christ and because you have grace, God has reversed the sowing and reaping process. Y'all so sin, you do. But do you reap punishment from it? Y'all need to thank God that you don't. Right? But here's what he says to him. He says, listen, this is what I've come to understand about God. Nobody perishes being innocent. Or where is the upright destroyed? Um, I'm, 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 so, I'm so used to hearing this from church folks. I'm so used to hearing church folks say, listen, if bad things come in your life, it's because you've done bad things. They've said, listen, if you do right, God will bless you. If you don't do well, God will not bless you. God will curse you. And, and, and that's, what, uh, that's what he has to say to his friend at the time. Look, look at chapter 5, verse 27. And this is the end of what Bildad, I mean, Elphaz has to say to Job. Sounds so familiar. He says, behold this. We have investigated it, and so it is. Hear it and know it for yourself. He said, listen, in all of my years of serving the Lord, that's what I've come to understand about God. Now, if you're a reader of the scripture and you already know that God has said Job has not sinned, what is Elphaz doing? Now, now um, he says he's lying. I'm not sure he's lying. He's just wrong. <laughs> He's just flat out wrong. He said, I've investigated it, and that's what I found to be true. Could be that he's flat out lying, or he could just be express expressing his bad theology. Now, see, this is the wonder of the literature. The, the writer has set you up as, as having inside knowledge that Job and his friends don't have in their circumstances. He's done it so that you can judge what they say, whether it's right or not. But here's what you have to know. In most of life, you don't have the inside knowledge about what God is doing in your life or anybody else's. But here is what the writer is saying. They're speaking very confidently about what God is doing, and they're giving these lectures about what they've learned about God, but the writer has already told you that's not what God is doing. Uh, Y'all need to hear a few more. Y'all need to hear a few more. So then Job in chapter 6 is going to respond to build that. Um, uh, Y'all don't need to read it all. Look, let's look at verse number 8, chapter 6. Oh, that my request might come to pass and that God would grant my longing. Would that God were willing to crush me, that he would lose his hand and cut me off. But it is still my consolation, and I rejoice in unsparing pain, that I would not deny the words of the Holy One. He's asking for an audience. He says, listen, Elphaz, I don't believe you. Listen, if I'm, of, uh, if, if I'm guilty of something, I need to hear it from the Lord. 
He says, I need to hear it from the Lord. Uh, look, look at down in verse number 24. And so when he finishes telling him, listen, I am, st I am still innocent of anything. I have no charges against me. Then he tells uh, Elphaz in, in verse 24, teach me and I will be silent and show me how I have erred. Look at verse 28. Now please look at me and see if I lie to your face. This is his way of saying, listen, I don't have any secret sins. So um, then the next friend up is going to be Bildad in chapter 8. Uh, Bildad in chapter 8. But let, let, me, let me take you back a little because th this part is just funny to me. Let me take you back to what Elphaz has to say uh, in chapter 5. Th this is just too funny. So Elphaz is trying to prove to Job that he's got some sin in his life and he is going to resort to, um, I'm going to tentatively call this word revelation. And I'm going to explain revelation later because, you know, everybody's got a revelation from God these days. Um, he says in verse number 8, I'm at chapter 5, this is Elphaz. He says, but as for me, I would seek God. This is what he tells Job. And I would place my cause before God who does great and unsearchable things, wonders without numbers. He gives rain on the earth and he sends water on the fields so that he sets on high those who are lowly and those who mourn are lifted to safety. He frustrates the plotting of the shrewd so that their hands cannot obtain success. That almost sounds orthodox, doesn't it? L listen to what he says. He captures the wise by their own shrewdness and the advice of the cunning is quickly th thwarted. He is indirectly calling Job cunning, right? He's trying to say you're wise, but God is going to thwart your wisdom. Um, he says, behold, how happy is the man whom God reproves, so do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. Y'all see it? See, um, the... Here's, what, here's most people's bad theology, and they get it from the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews says um, that um, every son God chastises. If you're not chastised, then you're not a son. But watch it. They'll tell you uh, because like any father whose child misbehaves, he chastises him. But here's the problem with the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews, the context is not sin. You get chastised because you are a child. Not because you're a sinning child. If, you're, if you don't get chastised, you're not a child. If you don't get scourged, the passage says. You get scourged because you are a son, not because you're a bad son. Every son gets chastised. That's according to the book of Hebrews. Um, he says, for he afflicts pain and he gives relief. He wounds and his hands also heal. But his, his impression is that he does it for those who have sinned. So Job defends himself, chapter 6. Uh, then we get uh, Bildad's and his response. L listen to Bildad. Uh, Bildad is in chapter 8. Then Bill said, Bildad the Shuite answered, How long will you say these things and the words of your mouth might be a mighty wind? Does God pervert justice? Or does the Almighty pervert what is right? He says, if your sons sinned against him, then he delivered them into the power of, of their transgression. Now that's awful, isn't it? He said, the reason your sons died is because of their own transgressions. But you as a reader know, why did his sons die? Because the Lord had given them over to it. For his own glory in the heavens, he has given them over to it. Um, look at verse number 20 of chapter 8. Lo, God will not reject a man of integrity, nor will he support the evildoers. He will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouting. When you do right, you'll laugh. If you don't do right, you'll grieve. Um, I, I don't know about y'all, but this... You know, what we've been talking about here is a way of understanding the redemption we have in Christ Jesus. And here is what the writer is giving us a picture of. Listen, the law has never kept men from, from the grace of God. 
the, the natural thinking is that the law said, I will set before you blessings and cursings. If you do right, you'll be blessed. If you don't do right, you'll be cursed. And we're thinking that that is how God deals with everybody. But what we miss is that God is above having to be locked into our ways of thinking about him. Um, I could go on to chapter 9. And we can see Job respond to Bildad. He says in verse 21, I am guiltless. I do not take notice of myself. I despise my life. It is all one. Therefore, I say he destroys the guiltless and the wicked. He says, listen, I am guiltless and he's destroying me. If he destroys the wicked also, then he destroys the guiltless and the wicked. And then Zophar has to pipe in in chapter 11. And he's got to give his part in what God is doing in his life. Look at chapter 11, verse number 13. If you will direct your heart right and spread out your hands to him, if iniquity is in your hands, put it far away and do not let wickedness dwell in your tent. And Job is going to have to respond to Zophar. I have to show you this one, what Job says to him in chapter 13. I love this one. Uh, look at chapter 13. This is Job's response. It's so wise. Chapter 13, behold, my eyes have seen all of this. My ear has heard and understood it. That's what they're talking about. What you know, I also know. I am not inferior to you. You see, he's getting a little agitated, isn't he? But I speak to the Almighty and I desire to argue with him. But you smear with lies. You are all worthless physicians. You know, I wish more church folk would respond to church folk like that. He said, you are all worthless physicians. On what would you be complete? Oh, that you would be completely silent and that it would become your wisdom. Please hear my argument and listen to the contentions of my lips. And, and let, drop down to verse number 12. He says, your memorial sayings are proverbs of ashes. Your defenses are defenses of clay. It, you know, if I can get... If I can get, you, you, you know, I, I was thinking about what we're trying to do here at South Point, and, and, I, and I thought about it this week. I said, I'm trying to have us have deep roots, deep roots in the historic Christian faith. So you can stand firm on solid ground and tell some church folk to just shut up. That's what Job said. I, you know, it would be better if you would just stop talking. He said, because the things you say are not true, you are a worthless physician. Now, I want to turn your attention to the end of the book where we get the point. But y'all have to keep in mind, this goes on and on and on and on. They're trying to prove to Job, listen, what you sow, you reap. God is doing this to you because you got sin. But you've already found out that this is not because Job has sinned. And then you go all the way to chapter 38. In chapter 38, God is going to respond to Job first. And then he is going to respond to Job's friends. Um, I, I turn to 38 because I just love what the Lord has to say. And now keep in mind, what, what you're going to hear is going to sound like a reproof of Job for sin. But has Job sinned with what he said? We've got to understand what God is saying then differently. Watch what he says, chapter 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and he said, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? <laughs> now keep in mind, all Job has done is complain to God and said, I'm innocent. Why is this happening to me? All he wants is an audience with God to say, what's going on here, God? And then he says, gird up your loins like a man and I will ask you and you instruct me. I love that because the Lord said, you've been asking me a whole lot of questions. Now, put your big boy pants on and let me ask you a few questions. And then he says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measures since you know? Or who stretches the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. He says, listen, you, you know, if you, were, if you were my partner in creation, maybe I have a responsibility to answer you. He said, but if I remember correctly, when I was doing all of this, you weren't there. 
Uh, listen to what he says in verse number 12. Have you ever in your life commanded the morning and caused the dawn to know its place? I, I love that. He says, listen, I call the morning every day. Were you ever able to call the morning? It, you know, I, I love the thought of that idea. It, uh, this is what G.K. Chesterton says about that idea. He says, it is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun. And every evening, do it again to the moon. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never gotten tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of an infant. For we have sinned and grown old, and our father is younger than we are. So God is reproving him for wanting to have an audience with him about what he is going through. He says, have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? I, I, I love it. So he, he, watch this. He chastises him for the audacity to try to prove, to prove his justification to not be suffering at the hands of God. But if you go over, he does it from chapter 31, 38 through 39 and 40. And in chapter 40, um, he, God, uh, God reproves him again. And it's not until chapter 42 that Job answers God. Right? Verse, verse 1 of chapter 42. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is that highest counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have declared that which I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Right? Job has just learned the lesson about God. But, but watch this. Now God turns to rebuke Job's three friends in chapter 30, uh, 42, verse 7. Listen to what it says. Now it came about after the Lord had spoken these words to Job, then the Lord said to Elphaz the Timnite, uh, he said, My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends because you have not spoken of me what is right, listen to God's words, as my servant Job has. Y'all see it? He says, listen, Job hadn't said anything wrong about me. He just doesn't have the right to ask me some questions. Y'all with me? He said, listen, it's within my right as Job's creator to put him through anything I want to, and he doesn't get to say to me, why, Lord, why? But he hadn't said anything wrong about me. He said, but you three. And the word is, you have set me on fire because you didn't say about me what was right. Now, y'all got to get this. There's a whole lot of talk from chapter 3 to 38. There's a whole lot of talk, a whole lot of words about God. And presently, there's a whole lot of voices talking about God. In the, world. It, the, the number of voices is as vast as the sea. And here's what y'all got to know. A whole lot of them are not right. And here's what the writer is communicating. Even in a casual setting like Job's living room, when God hears you talk about him, you got to be right. You don't get to be casually wrong and say, well, you know what I mean. There's a whole lot of folks talking about God, they're wrong and they're saying, well, you know what I mean. No, God is saying that stuff is setting me on fire because when you talk about me, you must be right. And if you don't know what I'm doing, just be quiet, is what he said. That's a good thing, that's a good theology. A good theology is if you don't know, say I don't know. It's important that y'all get what, what has just occurred. God says, I don't like it when people talk about me and they're not right. See, we, we, measure, we measure good preaching by whether it's good, not whether it's right. We, we want to hear preaching that sounds good to us. And nobody is asking, is he right? Is that the right meaning? Because whenever you say the Lord told me and the Lord said, you have to be Right. Yeah, Elphaz and his friends said a whole lot of things that sound good, but they weren't right. 
And because they weren't right, God said, my anger is kindled against you. It's, 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 a, it's a term that shows how you like the kindling. You set me on fire with what you said because what you said was not right. You had a bad theology. But he affirms that what Job said was right. He afflicts both the guiltless and the wicked. And he can do so because he is God and he is creator. And so then he asks, the Lord asks Elphaz and his friends to make sure Job prays for you. You, you better ask Job to pray for you. Or you're going to get the results of my kindled anger against you. Let, let, let me give you a few things in conclusion to think about from this chapter. A few really important points. No one can know God, what God is doing, by drawing conclusions about God from their own experiences. You all hear what I said? You can't live your life, watch things happen in life, and then say, as a result, this is what my experience tells me that God is doing. Because that's what his friends did. Listen, God can punish the guilty a hundred times for what they have done. And in the hundred and first time, he can bring suffering on the guiltless. And then your rule is null and void when it comes to God. Or God can watch someone sin and then in Christ forgive them for their sins and not bring the punishment that is due. So you can't draw conclusions about God from your experiences, although all over the world people are doing it. I've seen this happen a thousand times. This is what God is doing. Here's another one. What we say about God, even in the most casual settings, God takes very seriously. See, the only way you can say what God is doing is if God reveals it to you. Now, I, I know that's a sticky subject because there's a whole lot of folks will tell you the Lord revealed to me, the Lord told me. Let, let me give you all something to stand, some solid ground to stand on. Revelation, God has never taken lightly. He has never taken the communication of truth about himself to people lightly. Whenever God wants you to know something about him that you could not know from your experiences, from, th from no other way besides him letting you know, he has sent a messenger with it or he has worked a miracle so that you would know it was him. God does not whisper secrets in people's ears. He never has. Whenever God has wanted Israel to know what God was thinking, he sent a prophet. And then he put miracles in the hands of the prophets so that the prophets would know that they were sent by God. Listen, when uh, they're on Mount Carmel and Israel has to decide who's right, the prophets of Baal or Elisha. Elisha says, okay, then call on your God. And when they were finished and nothing happened, and he calls on God and fire falls from heaven and consumes all 300 of them, yeah, we'll listen to him. <laughs> listen. Even the Lord Jesus did miracles to prove he was from God. He didn't do miracles to show off. He said he did them so that you would know I was sent by the Father. So listen, that knucklehead in church who said the Lord told me last night, then you said, listen, this is Bayou country. Walk on it, part it, or do something, then I'll listen to you. Otherwise, you have no reason to listen. Because God doesn't expect you to just believe somebody haphazardly. He's never been that careless with revelation. Even the apostles had to do miracles to be believed, to be listened to. By the way, that's, that's one of the reasons why there's not a whole lot of miracles today, because God's not giving revelation like that today. Well, if I look for what God has already said, what God wants me to know, I look back at the revelation he has already given. Now, the Bible does say there will come a time when he will give new revelation and you will see miracles and signs and wonders at the end of time again. But until I see them, I'm going to stick with the revelation I've had. Um, here, here's the last one. 
God is to be revered as creator and not simply because of the good things he gives us. He is to be revered because he is the creator. We're supposed to revere him because of who he is and the power he has displayed in creating us and all the rest of this. And if he never gives us anything good, there's no reason why we still should not revere him. If he gives us good and takes it away, as creator, he still deserves to be revered. So listen, God doesn't need to bless you for you to glorify him. He doesn't need to bless you for you to glorify him. But particularly with wealth and with stuff. He has already given us the Lord Jesus. That's all the blessing you need to give God glory.